Before we begin today's episode, just a reminder to like, subscribe, and turn on the notification bell if you enjoy this episode. Forty-seven-year-old Paul Stevenson loved to ride his motorcycle to clear his mind, have a little fun, and explore the area around his town of Bundaberg, Queensland, Australia. A husband, father of two, soon-to-be grandfather, Paul was the kind of guy that everyone loved. He was hard-working, helpful, and kind. He was an experienced outdoorsman and a seasoned motorcycle rider. However, In the early morning hours of March 11, 2012, he rode off into the darkness and never returned. Two days after he vanished, Paul's motorcycle was recovered at the bottom of an embankment alongside his helmet. However, nothing else was found, not his keys, wallet, sunglasses, or Paul himself. There were no skid marks, blood, nothing to suggest an accident, and the damage to his bike was fairly light. For authorities, it was a confounding mystery. How does a man just vanish into thin air when out for a ride? For eight years, Paul's family have wondered what became of him and whether or not he is still alive. The more time passes, the more unlikely it seems, and yet they hold out hope, though they also prepare for the worst. Sadly, the worst may be the haunting pain of not knowing, of not finding him, of never learning the truth. All that remains is a bike helmet, a few frames of surveillance footage, and an enduring mystery that haunts not only a family, but an entire city. This is Trace Evidence, Episode 109, The Vanishing of Paul Stevenson. Welcome to Trace Evidence. I'm your host, Stephen Pacheco. Today we examine a mysterious disappearance in Australia. Before getting into the case, just a few notes about the show. Trace Evidence is a weekly true crime podcast focused on unsolved murders, disappearances, and other crimes. You can follow the show on social media on Twitter at TraceEvPod, Instagram at TraceEvidencePod, or by searching Facebook for Trace Evidence Podcast. The show is also on MeWe and Minds. If you're interested in supporting the show as it is a one-man operation and you'd like to get some Trace Evidence swag, there's a Patreon at patreon.com slash trace evidence or you can donate directly via PayPal. Visit trace-evidence.com for all social media links, donation options and contact information as well as thorough information on all episodes. To submit case suggestions, you can visit the website or email me directly at traceevidencepod at gmail.com. 47-year-old Paul Stevenson left home to go out for an early morning motorcycle ride and never returned, leaving a family and investigators with a great many questions and few, if any, answers. This is Episode 109, The Vanishing of Paul Stevenson. On Sunday, March 11, 2012, the sun rose just after 6 a.m. over the city of Bundaberg, Queensland, Australia. By the time the sun began to skip through the trees and warm the pavement and concrete of the city center, Paul Robert Stevenson had already gotten up, threw on his black leather jacket and jeans, walked out the door of his Sydney Street home with his helmet tucked under his arm, hopped on his beloved motorcycle, and began his ride towards Mount Perry heading in the direction of Paradise Dam. He never returned from that ride. The small town of Mount Perry sits in the shadow of the mountain, the tallest in the area, and is a stark contrast to the busy tourism gateway of Bundaberg, known for its prominence as a major sugarcane growing area and, of course, its second most valuable export, Bundaberg rum. Paradise Dam, or the Burnett River Dam, sits 80 kilometers or 50 miles to the southwest of Bundaberg, creating a reservoir, the aptly named Paradise Lake. The concrete of the gravity dam spans the river, cutting through the water like a sail as Paradise Lake ripples, casting reflections of the greenery which surrounds it. If images can be trusted, the area is beautiful, and it's quite clear why Paul may have elected to rise early, swinging around the curves of Mount Perry-Jinjin Road, a busy country road cutting from west to east, 
winding from near the Jinjin Rest Area to Mount Perry in the southeast. While it is a country road with beautiful scenery, it's also heavily trafficked. Nikki Wellen, Paul Stevenson's daughter, would later sit on her in-law's property, not far from where her father disappeared, watching the road and counting the cars to see just how much traffic passed through each day. According to the Morning Bulletin, it was easy to lose track with so many cars zooming through. For the family, that begged a curious question. How did so few see anything that fateful morning when Paul vanished? Paul married his wife, Julie, in 1990, and they had two children, Nikki and Tom. Paul was a very present and loving father, getting involved with his children's activities and being there to support them. According to an article from Nikki in That's Life, a magazine focused on everyday life stories, Julie and Paul were very happy together, and the family was very close. According to Nikki, it was a very normal life. She described it saying, quote, at weekends, we'd head down to the local junior football club where dad was president or have mates over for Barbies in the backyard, end quote. Paul worked as a diesel fitter, a type of mechanic who specializes in diesel engines, be they in trucks, tractors, oil rigs, or machine engines. It wasn't an easy job by far, and the hours were long, but Paul was good with his hands. He enjoyed his work and supported his family well. Paul, it seems, was what you might imagine of the good father, loving to his wife, close and supportive of his children, hardworking and determined to give them a better life. Whether he was with Nikki at a dance rehearsal or Tom at a football game, he was always their number one fan. After so many years of thinking of only his family, working hard to bring them the life they'd become accustomed to, he finally made a choice to bring a little project on for himself. When the kids were getting older, Paul purchased a 1978 Honda CB750, an extremely popular and respected motorcycle voted one of the greatest motorbikes ever by the Discovery Channel, and it even has a place in the American Motorcyclists Association's Hall of Fame. Of course, when Paul purchased the used bike, it wasn't in the best shape. However, being a man familiar with mechanics and engines, to Paul, this would be an exciting hobby to work on restoring the bike and getting it back in condition to take it out for some rides. It wouldn't be easy to repair the bike, and it wouldn't be cheap. According to Nikki, Paul directed most of his income towards the family, but he would sock away little bits here and there to be able to get the parts he needed to get the engine roaring again. When he finally completed the bike, he was ecstatic, and soon he was riding in his free time, experiencing the excitement of cruising down the road. The bike was Paul's pride and joy. He was very proud of completing it and being able to ride. According to Nikki, Paul was always saying, quote, I feel so free exploring the open roads, end quote. But he didn't just ride for fun. Paul often made charity runs to help raise funds for local cancer research. Sometimes Paul would ride alone on these charitable runs. Other times his son Tom would join him. By his family, Paul has been described as intelligent, exceedingly funny, and very outgoing. He was a go-getter. He was social and enjoyed making others laugh. Paul was popular in the community, very involved, and he loved doing what he could to help out. More than anything, he loved his family, and as we've established, was very present in their lives. High or low, good or bad, Paul was always there. Until he wasn't. On Saturday, March 10th, the day before he vanished, Paul and his family were in a celebratory mood. It was Paul and Julie's 22nd anniversary, and the family had all gathered to celebrate the milestone. Paul and Julie had married young, 20 years old, and this gave Nikki some comfort. She'd been with her boyfriend for two years and was then 18 years old when she discovered that she was pregnant. Nikki was nervous about telling her father. She wasn't sure what he would say, but knowing he had married at such a young age, there was hope that he would understand. Paul, though, did more than just understand. He jumped up, wrapped his arms around his daughter, and told her how excited he was. According to Nikki, as they embraced, Paul said, quote, I'm so happy I'm going to be a grandpa, end quote. Paul explained his plans to his family. The next day, he was to get up early, head out on his bike, take the winding way towards Paradise Dam, 
and enjoy the freedom and excitement of riding. Over the years, Paul had become a seasoned rider, experienced and cautious. He didn't fly through curves, he didn't try to break the sound barrier, he just enjoyed leisurely rides through the beauty of his surroundings. After riding that morning, he planned to return home for a shower before heading down to the football club where he was president for a 9 a.m. meeting. Finally, upon his return home, Paul would join his family as they went to visit some friends. It was set to be a fun, laid-back afternoon, but something went terribly wrong, and Paul never came back. The last time Nikki saw her father, he was sipping a beer, and as Nikki embraced him before heading home, she placed a kiss on his cheek, and he said, Night, love. Paul often had sleeping problems, insomnia in some way, and so it was totally normal for him to be up and about before anyone else had even woken up. Oftentimes, Paul would go for a ride in the early morning twilight, and Sunday, March 11th, was no different. He wasn't expected home until late morning, early afternoon. When Nikki arrived, prepared to get together for their visit, Paul wasn't home yet. Julie told her that he'd likely be home in a few hours. But when those hours passed, the family began to grow concerned. Both Julie and Nikki grabbed their phones and began calling and texting. But the phone just rang, and text messages received no response. It was strange to them, even if he had gotten sidetracked. Paul was always very communicative. He'd always call or text to explain the delay and give an estimated time for his return. But on this day, there was nothing. No calls, no messages, no answer to multiple inbound calls. His bike was gone, so they knew at a minimum he had gone out for his ride, though no one knew what time he left that morning or exactly what path he was taking. Just before 6 p.m., calls to Paul's phone began going straight to voicemail, suggesting it had been powered off, destroyed, or the battery had died. When 6 p.m. finally hit, Julie picked up the phone and called the football club, wondering if it was possible that Paul had gotten caught up in something and lost track of time. It wouldn't be unusual for Paul to stick around to help someone out or lend his ability to solve a problem. The response Julie got, though, sent chills down her spine. When she asked about her husband, she received the answer that no one had seen Paul at the club that day. He'd never arrived, and now the family began to wonder where he could possibly be. Considering the roads towards the dam had some sharp curves, of course their minds immediately went to the possibility of an accident. Had he broken down, fallen off his bike, or worse, been struck by a car and was being rushed to a hospital? Nikki and her boyfriend at the time, Brenton, got in the car and began driving around, following the path they believed Paul may have taken. Throughout the drive, no matter how many times they backtracked, no matter how slow they went and how hard they looked, they couldn't find any signs of Paul. It was a sleepless night wondering what could have happened, where Paul could be, and whether or not he was all right. When the sun rose the following day, Monday, March 12th, and Paul still hadn't arrived or called, his family went down to the nearest police station. Early in the morning, around 6 a.m., they were outside buzzing the intercom to be led into the station, where they explained the situation and began the process of filing a missing persons report. Questions were asked, as they always are, about Paul and his state of mind. Was there a history of depression, mental illness? No. Had he ever gone away without telling anyone? No. What's the longest he's ever been gone without contact? An hour, maybe two. When all was said and done, authorities felt this was a situation where it was unlikely that Paul had just gone off somewhere. A massive search of the area was launched. The search would include police, volunteers including family, friends, and others from town, tracking dogs, indigenous trackers, and a police helicopter. The family paid for a second helicopter from a search and rescue group. All told, more than 200 individuals were involved in the search for Paul. That first day, there was nothing. No signs, no scents picked up, no tracks discovered. Bundaberg Police Inspector Kev Gutteridge was astonished by the lack of answers, telling the Coffs Coast advocate, quote, he's nowhere to be seen, end quote. Nikki later told the News Mail, quote, what we covered in that search was crazy, and the number of volunteers was crazy. You just think, how could anything be missed, end quote. 
According to Nikki, during the first day of the search, a local psychic who had heard about Paul's disappearance contacted the family. The psychic claimed to have seen Paul in a vision and said there was a steep embankment and he had fallen down it. After the first day's search yielded no results, Nikki told MyLife.com that she had a strange dream of the mountain ranges of Mount Perry. Desperate the next day, Nikki told authorities about both the psychic and her dream. During the search, police visited local businesses in hopes of finding surveillance footage which might give them a glimpse of Paul roaring by or maybe stopping in for a drink or to fill his tank. At a service station, they got lucky. Surveillance footage from that morning was found. At approximately 3.28 a.m., Paul had pulled in to fill up. This was the only footage, as far as we know, that had any kind of sign of Paul that morning. Considering that he had trouble sleeping and was often awake before others, he was often up early, but according to his family, being out riding at 3.28 a.m. was even early by Paul's standards. Paul took his black helmet off the bike, slipped it over his head, climbed on, and drove off into the early morning darkness, leaving no traces behind. On the second day of the search, the rescue helicopter was piloted by Dick Snell, and on board were several people, including a paramedic. All of them were looking down as they flew over the roads and woods between Jinjin and Mount Perry. At approximately 10.45 a.m., they saw something. Passing over and sinking down for a closer look at a bend in the road, the paramedic called out and everyone looked. There, not far off the side of the road, partially obscured by foliage, was what appeared to be a motorcycle lying on its side with a black helmet beside it. The location radioed down to investigators, and they headed towards the spot not far from the Wamba Winery along Jinjin Mount Perry Road. There, they found Paul's prized 1978 Honda motorcycle. Just hours after Nikki had told authorities about her dream and the psychic's account, her phone rang. When she picked up, the Bundaberg police were on the line. They told Nikki they had found Paul's bike, though there was no sign of Paul himself. Under the bike, they'd found a few snakes sheltering themselves, which may suggest the bike had been there the whole time. It was reported that the bike and helmet were found down the embankment, and there was damage to the bike, but nothing major. Some scrapes and one of the turn indicators was broken. However, it was quickly assessed that there was nothing mechanically wrong with the bike, and the damage to it was not enough to have been caused by a motor vehicle collision. It's interesting to note that, in several articles, it was stated that Paul's helmet and saddlebags appeared to have been hidden near the bike, though whether or not that's true, I can't say for sure. Initially, police wondered if the bike had been there due to Paul going off the side of the road, or perhaps if someone had placed the bike in that location. While it was possible it was missed during the first day of searching, there was something about the scene which didn't seem right. While Paul's bike and helmet were found, other items were missing, including his wallet, keys, phone, sunglasses, and binoculars. While Paul's wallet was missing, reportedly, he didn't have any cash on him that morning, but he did have his key card, a sort of debit card. To this day, there's been no activity on his key card or his cell phone. Some people wondered if Paul may have pulled off to take a hike through the wilderness. According to his family, Paul was an experienced outdoorsman who loved exploring and later telling his family about the places he'd discovered. Some thought this might explain why his binoculars were missing, though it seemed quite clear that he wasn't just going to leave his bike on the side of the road or toss it down an embankment. Some began to theorize about the possibility of a hand injury, resulted in Paul becoming confused and possibly wandering off, getting lost in the wilderness or... Maybe he suffered a stroke or a heart attack during an expedition, but no one had evidence for any of these theories. The bike was found, which gave the family some hope that Paul could be in the area, but the scene was weird. No skid marks or blood was found, which seemed to give the impression that, whatever had happened, Paul had not likely been severely injured if indeed it had been some kind of an accident. However, the excitement of finding the bike soon led way to terror, as the family now had to confront the realization that Paul was truly missing. The search for Paul continued, but was officially called off after the fourth day, though friends and family continued their own searches. 
crawling up and down ridges and embankments, though, like the official search, they would not find any traces of Paul either. All of the time, resources, and manpower applied to the search had only been able to find and recover his bike and helmet, but not Paul himself, nor were authorities any more informed about what might have happened. In a public plea, both authorities and the family begged for assistance from the public. It was difficult to imagine that on such a busy road no one saw anything, though it's also important to note that during the time Paul was riding, as far as we know, it was dark and early morning. Being that there's no knowledge about what time Paul vanished and his bike went down the embankment, it's considered possible that someone may have seen something that day. Beyond information leading to Paul, the family asked that if anyone found any of Paul's belongings, keys, wallet, sunglasses, that they call and report it to Crime Stoppers. Even the smallest piece of evidence could lead to answers that had left the family in limbo. Nikki described the situation, saying, quote, You don't know how to express yourself. You can't feel anything because you don't know. If we could find something out, it would make life a lot easier, in one way. End quote. Police attempted to ping and triangulate and approximate an area where the phone may have been, hoping that it was still in Paul's possession, though they were unable to track the phone at all. Reportedly, all along that road, and specifically in the area where his bike was found, cell phone reception was very poor at best. The mystery was frustrating and difficult. Inspector Gutteridge later told the Courier Mail, quote, I haven't encountered anything of this nature in 25 years with the exception of the Mick Isles case. There's no forensic evidence to support that the bike had been crashed, and that's part of the mystery. Certainly a crash in that location would have resulted in significant injuries to a person and also much more damage to that machine. There's nothing to suggest criminal involvement at this stage. It appears he's just got off the bike and walked away into the scrub. End quote. For the record, the Mick Isles case refers to a Queensland police officer who vanished in September of 2009. After public pleas for assistance, authorities placed a mannequin in the spot where Paul's bike was found. The mannequin held a sign asking passers-by to stop if they had any information. Surprisingly, police were contacted by a set of witnesses who were traveling through the area the day Paul vanished. According to these witnesses, they spotted a man fitting Paul's description walking along the road that day, not far from where the bike was found. The man was seen walking east, though this is the last sighting of Paul Stevenson, if it can be confirmed. He was seen approximately 600 meters or 2,000 feet from the bike at approximately 1 p.m. on March 11th, a little less than 10 hours after the surveillance footage captured him at the gas station. Paul's sister, Tony, is a reporter, and in late March of 2011, a few weeks after her brother vanished, she wrote a heartbreaking piece about him. In part, the article written for The Observer reads, quote, Anxiety is the call to say your brother didn't make it home from a motorbike ride. Hope is what you hold on to when 48 hours later, a police helicopter finds his crashed road bike. Despair is what engulfs you when hours, days, weeks pass and you still haven't found him. It is now a hellish 20 days since my brother, Paul Stevenson, disappeared without a trace. End quote. Paul has missed so many important milestones since his disappearance. The birth of his granddaughter and his second granddaughter, his daughter's wedding, his son's 18th birthday. For the family, they simply don't believe that Paul could have just gone off, nor do they believe he was lost somewhere in the wilderness. For them, the belief is that foul play must be connected in some way. Nikki is the leading advocate for trying to find her father, and in an interview with The Chronicle, she stated, quote, In today's day and age, how can someone just vanish? I think someone knows something. End quote. Nikki has been very vocal about her father's disappearance and has made public pleas for information related to his whereabouts, urging citizens to call in and report what they know, specifying that they can be completely anonymous if they so choose. In March of 2013, one year after Paul's disappearance, the family planned a special day known as Green Day. Green, as explained in an article from the Western Star, is the color of hope, 
And it was the family's hope that they might be able to draw more attention to not just Paul's case, but all missing persons. Residents were asked to wear green in solidarity with families who had missing loved ones. The family, to this day, struggles to find answers, oscillating between foul play and something else that they just can't quite conceive. For investigators, it's as mysterious today as it was the day it happened, with a police spokesperson explaining, quote, We can't rule anything out. Accident, suicide, foul play, all those go through your mind, but there's just no evidence of anything at all. End quote. Paul's case began growing cold in the weeks following his disappearance. While authorities say the investigation is still open and active, they really have nowhere to go with it. All they have, and the only things that have ever been found, are Paul's bike and his helmet. There's not even a hint of a lead tucked away somewhere in the files, at least not one that's ever been discovered. In what can only be described as heartbreaking, Nikki's first daughter, Mia, who was born three months after Paul's disappearance, has never met her grandfather but has heard all about him. In an article from the Courier Mail, Nikki explained how, when she was first learning to speak, she would tell her mom that there's a star in the sky for her grandpa, and when she looks at the stars, she blows kisses for him. In April of 2016, four years after Paul vanished with no contact, sightings, or other information, a coroner's inquest was held. Paul was officially declared deceased, and a death certificate was issued to the family. In response to this, the family planned to hold a memorial for Paul. Nikki explained to the Sunshine Coast Daily, quote, In that coroner's report, obviously, they couldn't give us what had happened because no one knows. They can't give us what's happened with death, so the death's unknown, but we do have a death certificate. We've decided to hold a celebration of his life. It's more along the lines of a memorial than a funeral. Basically, this is to say, see you later and give Dad the time he needed to be remembered for the person he was. He was such a wonderful person, and so many people knew him and loved him for that reason. End quote. It's believed that at the time of his disappearance, Paul Stevenson was wearing a black leather riding jacket, blue Wrangler jeans, brown boots, and a black full-face helmet. Paul is described as being a white male with brown hair and brown eyes, standing approximately 178 centimeters or 5 feet 8 inches tall. Paul was last seen on surveillance footage fueling his black 1978 Honda motorcycle, which was later found down an embankment 16 kilometers or 10 miles east of Mount Perry Township. Despite extensive searches, Paul has never been found outside of one possible sighting he has never been seen. If Paul is alive today, he would be 55 years old. There's a lot of different theories about what may have happened to Paul, but only a handful of those theories endure. Some believe that Paul may have been the victim of foul play. For others, it's more likely that the outdoorsman walked off into the woods to explore and have a look around when he either had an accident or was injured or killed in some way. Some still believe there's the possibility that Paul may have gone off on his own, intending to disappear, though his family doesn't believe this, and in the eight years since he was last seen, there's been no activity on his bank accounts or key cards, and a forensic examination of his bank account showed no strange transactions or withdrawals. Unfortunately, in the absence of their patriarch, the Stevenson family has experienced a horrifying roller coaster of difficult and painful emotions. Their Christmas celebrations, once an extravaganza of fun and excitement, have become more subdued and difficult. While the family maintains contact with authorities, there have been no developments and the calls become fewer and further between. They have no place to mourn, no place to grieve, other than a stretch of road where his bike was found nearly a decade ago. The memories are still strong, the emotions powerful, and the devastation overwhelming. In an interview with the Courier Mail, Nikki stated, quote, You still wait for him to walk in the back door and come home from work. It only feels like yesterday when we saw him. I worry about mom because she's lost her partner and her best friend.
Paul Stevenson was a family man, community volunteer, diesel engine mechanic, and motorcycle enthusiast. He was dependable, honest, loving, and funny. He put his family above all else, and as he approached the age of 50, he was enjoying his life and especially those calm and quiet rides he'd often take on his motorcycle. Sometimes to the city, most of the time out into the country, where he would sometimes stop to explore and discover new areas. However, early on Sunday morning, he went riding and never returned. In the wake of his disappearance, both his family and investigators struggled to gain any knowledge that might explain where Paul went and what happened. After his bike was found, everyone was only left with more questions than answers. There's a few different theories, certainly some with more belief behind them than others. In a case this mysterious, with so few clues, it would be difficult to imagine there wouldn't be a sizable amount of theories, and yet, generally, there are three. The first one to begin with is one which seems unlikely, as it isn't believed by the families, nor is it believed by authorities, though they have said they have to keep all potential outcomes open. So, we'll begin with a theory that I often bypass, but in this case I think it needs to be addressed. Or, at least if I don't address it, people will ask why. That's the old standby theory that someone's disappearance is of their own choice. So, did Paul Stevenson ride off into the early morning darkness with plans of never returning? Usually, when someone chooses to disappear, they have some form or fashion of a reason. Trouble at home, struggles with mental health issues, lost loved ones, loss of a job, some kind of major trauma. In Paul's case, we have none of that. The family's been very open about what kind of person Paul was. He was dedicated to his family, loved his wife, was active in the community, and seemed to truly love life. He treasured his restored motorcycle and found solace and joy in taking it for long rides around winding roads cutting through the wilderness. At the time of his disappearance, he had two children, one of whom was pregnant with her first child, a caring and loving mother, and just the day before, he had celebrated his 22nd wedding anniversary. Now, it's not to say that someone can't choose to disappear for no reason at all. I'm sure that's happened in the past. But the question really becomes how Paul could have done it if that's what happened. His bike was found down an embankment, partially scraped up with a broken turn signal and no major damage that would have made it unrideable. So why not continue riding out of town if that was the plan? Left behind was only the bike and his helmet. Everything else he had vanished along with him, including his wallet and key card. His bank account's never been accessed since his disappearance, nor has his cell phone. None of the belongings he had on him have ever been found, and outside of a sighting which described a man like Paul walking down the road, no one has seen him anywhere. Sure, maybe you could disappear in today's world without being found if you truly wanted to. We know Paul was an experienced outdoorsman, so you can't completely rule out the possibility that he could have gone off into the wilderness with a plan of not returning. Of course, if that was the case, he sure didn't bring anything with him to make the trip easier. No food, water, changes of clothes, supplies of any kind, or money. Now, some have suggested the possibility that Paul could have made arrangements for someone to pick him up along the road that day, but if so, who? There doesn't appear to be anyone close to him that has even a hint of suspicion on them. Again, not impossible, but somewhat improbable. I think ultimately at the heart of the so-called walk-away theory, there's not much there to support it. It's purely speculative, and unlike so many cases in the past, we don't have even the slightest indicator that this is something Paul would do. He was excited to be a grandfather, he enjoyed his job, he loved his family, and he adored his bike. What would make a man not only choose to leave that behind, but also cause his family and friends so much needless pain? Paul was certainly not a cruel man, so many, including myself, find it extremely difficult to believe this theory. There's only one angle of this theory that I could possibly believe, and it's more of a split-off of this theory rather than the actual theory itself. Some have put forth the possibility that Paul could have sustained a head injury. While we have no indications of an accident, there's the possibility that Paul was slowing down to stop along the side of the road 
when he slipped and went down the embankment with his bike. He may have stopped, taken his helmet off, and perhaps was shifting his weight the wrong way and rolled down. There's also the possibility that someone was coming from the other direction, began to cross the line, and Paul veered to avoid them. Either way, it all leads to the same speculation that Paul may have sustained a head injury that resulted in memory loss or even brain damage, and following this, in a haze, he walked off. Maybe someone picked him up, or maybe he walked further into the wilderness and couldn't find his way back. That's something I could believe, more so than the possibility of him going into the wilderness, more so than going off down the road and catching a ride. His disappearance was big news at the time, and it seems likely that if someone had given him a ride, they'd have heard about the disappearance and realized he was the man they had given a ride to. In the wilderness, however, there's a wide array of dangers that he could have come across, especially if his mind wasn't working properly. I suppose it becomes a matter of how long he walked, but considering the risks he would face out in the wild, that leads us into our next theory. Some have speculated that Paul's disappearance may have been purely accidental in relation to his love of exploration. There's been consideration given to the theory that Paul may have parked his bike with the plan of going up into the wilderness to explore. Remember, he had binoculars with him that were never found, so it's entirely possible that was part of his plan that day. We know from the family this was something he loved to do, so it's not entirely impossible that he could have done this that day and something just went wrong whether it was a fall, animal attack, or perhaps something like a stroke or a heart attack. The area was searched extensively, but it's important to note that his bike wasn't found until the second day of the search, and it was spotted by a helicopter, not by those who were searching on foot and going through the bush. There's a lot of national parks, state forests, and reserves surrounding the place where Paul's bike was found. I find it somewhat difficult to believe He'd have left his bike on the side of the road if he was planning to hike too deeply into the wilderness. Maybe if he wasn't going far, maybe if he was planning to return shortly. But if he was going on some hour-long hike, I just don't see him doing that. Aside from the fact that someone could have stolen it, he also had the risk of someone swinging around a curve and smashing into it, sending it tumbling down the embankment that he had to see when he stopped, if that's what happened. So let's just assume Paul decided to go into the hills and see what was out there. He was an experienced outdoorsman. He would know what he was doing and he likely would have been careful about how he was traveling. That doesn't rule out the possibility of an accident, though. Anything could have happened out there. Remember, they found snakes under his bike as well, so we could be looking at some kind of an animal attack, snake bite, slip and fall. There's certainly no shortage of venomous snakes in Queensland. The possibilities are pretty unlimited when you're looking at all of the things that could have happened when you're out in the wild. Paul had no protection either. As far as we know, he had no weapons with him. His cell phone wouldn't have been functioning due to limited, if not completely lost, cell phone signals. He couldn't use his phone's GPS. He couldn't call for help. What do you think? Did Paul take a hike looking to experience a beautiful view, a feel for the wild, or just maybe to take a break from riding and stretch his legs, and during the process, something went wrong and he was severely injured or even killed? To me, it's not something you can rule out. There's obviously a lot of areas around there that someone could experience a life-threatening situation. While some may believe that Paul never returned home due to his own choices, I think it's a lot more likely that he didn't return home because he wasn't able to. This was a guy who stayed in constant communication. He didn't wander off without telling people, and he certainly didn't take trips for hours without so much as a call or text. We know his phone didn't have reception. So, for the sake of argument, let's say he gave it a shot, but his phone wasn't working. Maybe he thought it would be a quick trek, and it turned into something far worse. Many believe that this is the theory that holds the answers, and if that's true, that means somewhere in the large swath of land where Paul's bike was found, there's the possibility that his remains are also there. Searchers poured over the area for days, friends and family kept looking for even more days, but no one found anything. No body, binoculars, keys, wallet, phone, or sunglasses. 
Interestingly, while on-the-ground photos appear to show dense forests on the sides of the road, satellite imaging tells a different story. Yes, the road is lined with trees at many points, and there are areas along the road where there's quite a dense forestry, but there are also stretches of the road where it's thick, but once you head a little bit into the trees on either side, you'll find yourself in a more wide-open expanse of rolling hills, mountains, and valleys. It's truly hard to say, and as someone who has absolutely no experience in the wilds of Australia, it's difficult for me to explain the vastness and challenges of that terrain. There's only so much you can glean from photos, statements, and articles. As in so many cases involving the wilderness, there's no denying the possibility that Paul could have ended up out there and searches simply failed to reveal his location. While this is one of the more popular theories, there is one more. And in that theory, it's argued that what happened to Paul may not have been by any choice he personally made, but perhaps a choice made by someone else. Much of the family believes Paul's disappearance has to have been connected to foul play, and frankly, they have a few good reasons why. Outside of what we've discussed already about how Paul seemed like the most unlikely person to just run off, the situation is bizarre in that no body was found, nor were any of Paul's personal belongings. While the damage to the bike wasn't extensive enough to suggest an accident, there is the possibility that something else may have happened. Paul could have pulled over and someone stopped under the guise of asking for directions and really had the intent to abduct or rob Paul and things went bad. There's certainly the possibility that someone may have tried, intentionally, to force Paul off the road and that's how the bike ended up down the embankment. There's also some who speculate that someone may have accidentally forced Paul off the road and either found him injured and tried to bring him somewhere, at which time he died and they panicked, or perhaps they found him and he was already dead. The absence of blood, though, would seem to suggest that if something did happen to Paul in terms of foul play, it likely didn't happen in that particular location. What if Paul pulled over for one reason or another, and his bike went sliding down the embankment? Maybe his helmet was hanging off the handlebar. So Paul, stranded now, waves someone down for help. Maybe he knows the bike is too heavy to get up, and so he needs a ride to get someone with a tow to pull it up. Under those circumstances, it would all depend on exactly whose car he got into. Now, if the witness account is accurate, Paul was seen walking down the road around 1 p.m. That may be accurate and could still fit into the possibility that Paul was looking for help. However, we know Paul was out riding hours before sunrise, and that would certainly make it easier for someone to not see him along the side of the road. I don't know what it's like in Australia, but Saturday is a big party night in the States, so I wouldn't be surprised if someone was driving home drunk at 3 or 4 in the morning. Some believe that the spot where the bike was found was not the spot from which Paul disappeared. There's been some debate about the fact that someone may have killed or abducted Paul, and they simply got his bike into the back of their truck or trailer. Maybe they had rails to walk it up or a lift gate type apparatus, and that section of the road was chosen for having fairly dense wilderness, at which point they simply pushed the bike and let it slide down the embankment on its own. That might explain why there was an extensive damage. We know Paul didn't have any cash on him. If someone wanted to rob him, they might be annoyed to find they'd wasted their time. On the other hand, there are certainly robbers who don't care and plan to kill you afterwards, no matter what the outcome. There's a lot of places in that area where someone could dispose of a body, and it would be difficult, if not impossible, to locate. From Paradise Lake to the wilderness to the possibility of someone taking Paul elsewhere, perhaps somewhere very far away. When you look at it all side by side, I do think there's plenty of room to consider foul play. Maybe someone didn't like Paul. Maybe someone just saw an easy opportunity. Maybe the bike was too unique and identifiable to take with them, and so they decided to get rid of it. So many possibilities and so little evidence to support any of them. For me, however, when looking it all over, I'm very torn between getting lost and injured or foul play. I wish we had more to work with on this case. When looking at satellite imagery of the area, I did find it fascinating that there were a few homes near Jinjin Mount Perry Road. 
Most of them are pushed back a ways from the road. But what if Paul went looking for help at a nearby home and found someone who was less than welcoming? Someone who didn't appreciate an unknown man wandering onto their property, be it the dark of morning or the light of day. Hell, there could be tunnels, wells, other dangers in that area that are covered over or difficult to see. We definitely, though, can't rule out the possibility that Paul may have knocked on the wrong door, nor can we dismiss the tragic chance that Paul was murdered. Paul Stevenson rode off into the early morning darkness and never returned. For eight years, his family has struggled with trying to come to terms with losing him, and the absence of any evidence or leads has only been all the more difficult to accept. A loving father vanishes, a husband disappears, a soon-to-be grandfather is gone in the blink of an eye, and no one knows anything, no one saw anything, no one heard anything, along a busy stretch of country road. In the years since, no new evidence has been found, no leads developed, no tips given, and no advances made on the case. It truly is a startling mystery, and unfortunately, unless new information is found, someone comes forward, or Paul himself is found, his disappearance will remain open, unsolved, and very cold. If you're looking for more information about the vanishing of Paul Stevenson, there are many articles, news stories, and forums discussing his case. If you have any information about the vanishing of Paul Stevenson, please contact Crime Stoppers at 800-333-000. You can also call the Bundaberg Police at 4153-9111. You can send an email to missingpaulstevenson at gmail.com or look for the Facebook group Missing Paul Stevenson Bundaberg. You can also share posts about Paul's disappearance using the hashtag MissingYouPaul. What do you believe happened? Tweet me at TraceEvPod, email me at TraceEvidencePod at gmail.com, tag me on Instagram at TraceEvidencePod, or comment in the Facebook group. I've had a couple of people ask me about the availability of Trace Evidence merchandise. There's a couple of places you can go. You can go to traceevidence.threadless.com to see the wide selection of t-shirts and stickers and other items. You can also just go straight to the website trace-evidence.com and click the merch link in the header, which will provide you with links to places where all Trace Evidence merchandise is available. Did you know the True Crime Podcast Festival is taking place in Kansas City, Missouri this year? I'll be there representing Trace Evidence, along with hundreds of other true crime podcasters. If you visit truecrimepodcastfestival.com slash trace, you'll receive 10% off your ticket. I had a really amazing time there last year, and I love meeting listeners, so I'd love to see you there this year. Remember. TrueCrimePodcastFestival.com slash trace, or simply use promo code trace at checkout. I feel like I would be remiss if I didn't address the international pandemic that's going on right now with the coronavirus. Times are very difficult at the moment. There's a lot of quarantining going on. There's a lot of being trapped in your homes, afraid to go out. The world can be a pretty dark place, so maybe use this opportunity to make some phone calls, call people that you care about, check in on them, just say hello. It's a good time to reconnect. We live in such a divisive world these days that when you're given the opportunity to reach out and reconnect or just speak to someone that you care about, you should certainly take it. Depending how things go over the next few weeks, I'll probably pop up with some random live streams here and there just to connect with you guys, have some entertainment, and to save myself from going stir-crazy inside of my house, which I rarely leave anyway, but for some reason when I can't leave it, I have this desperate need to get out. So watch my social media for those. I'll be announcing them, and maybe I'll do some live streams on social media accounts I don't normally do them on, like Twitter or Instagram. 
it's time to thank our Patreon producers. Special shout out to Tara Doble, Alicia Lorraine, Angie Dodd, Brittany Bivens, Brian Kemmerling, Roberta Jansen, Krista Colvin, Diane Dyson, Eamon Brady, Bacon Bits the Cat, Pamela Coburn, Abigail, Brett Eady, Kevin Bonham, Emily Smith, Emma Vachon, Gerard Lopez Barbosa, Jessica, Laura Dickinson, Linda Halcrow, Nick Mohar Schurz, Megan Cotter, Quinn McBreen, Randy Wyland, Robbie Blue, Tom Archer, and Tracy Woods. If you think your name should be on this list but it's not, please contact me as Patreon is often terrible at organizing the lists properly. I want to thank you for listening to this episode, and I hope you'll join me next week for another unsolved case on the next episode of Trace Evidence. Trace Evidence